All right, welcome to One and All Church this weekend. Uh, welcome to all our campuses at West Covino and uh, obviously online and also Rancho. Glad you're with us. Look, folks, I believe that the series that we're doing right now is perhaps one of the most important series that we've ever done in the life of our church because the verdict, as we said, week one is out. We now know that after years of research, the home really does matter. It matters for society. It matters for culture. It matters to you because you are a product to a great degree of the family life in which you were raised. You are who you are now because of mom and dad and the family and your relatives. And so we want to get this family thing right. We also now know, and we've known for some time, that if we're going to address family, we've got to first address the marriage. And in marriage relationships, you cannot hide the tension that exists in the family from the children and everybody around. In fact, psychology today says this, when it comes to the relationship between their parents, no irritated eye roll goes unseen and no whispered criticism goes unheard. No matter how hard we may try to conceal problems, children are sensitive to the tensions between their parents and are directly influenced by the way their parents interact. So we've got to get this family thing right. And we talked about there are two marriage killers, two things that come in to cause conflict and tension. And i got to tell you that I've been in ministry for a lot of years now, and I don't think I've ever received as many cards and emails from guys congratulating me on last week's message. <laughs> now, I've heard from the women, but never from so many guys. In fact, I went to the dentist this week, and there was a church member there, and I sat down, we recognized each other, and he says, Pastor Jeff, I want to thank you for last week's message. And if you missed last week, by the way, you ought to get your husband or your wife and sit down and watch it together, even with your children, because we talked about how intimacy in marriage is a covenant renewal ceremony established by God to remind us of the original covenant that we made to come out of isolation and individualism and to come together as one. And it's an important aspect to the marriage. So if there are problems there, we have to solve those issues. They're important. The second marriage killer, though, everyone knows what it is. It's the idea of finance and money. Uh, Larry Burkett says that money is either the best or the worst area of communication in our marriages. After years as financial counselor and working with marriage counselors, I know that money and money fights are the number one cause of divorce. And he mentions a word called habitudes, which is a combination of habits and attitudes. And he says, when you have two people coming together, very seldom do they agree on habits and attitudes concerning money. And that causes great conflict. And remember, this is the number one marriage killer or source of conflict. And it usually happens in two areas. Provision, are we going to have enough to do what we want to do? Are we going to have enough to run this household, especially when the children come along? Are we going to have enough? And then the other is debt. How are we going to pay for all these things that we owe? And unfortunately, the way society is set up today in the West, you have enormous debt usually before you even get married. You inherit debt from each other, whether it's school, property, whatever it is. Now, in order to deal with this appropriately, we have to first admit the problem that most of us have, and I say most of us. Did you hear me say that? When I mean most, I mean you, me, all of us, because we grow up in Western society. So don't put me up on a pedestal as your example. I'm saying that we are all tempted by this, that we are tyrannized by money and stuff in the West. We are tyrannized. We're controlled by it. Proverbs 21 in the Old Testament tells us, the wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. So even the Bible in the Old Testament says there are two kinds of people, the one who saves and invests, the other who spends whatever he or she gets. And when you live in this culture where it's so easily easy to spend, to think that you can click a button and Amazon will deliver it right to your house. Everything is so much easier now, and that kind of spending is fun. Let's be honest. Boom, there it is. Boom, there it is. That's fun. You can do whatever you want. You can have whatever your eyes desire. No character or discipline or commitment is required in this, and it's all fun until what? Credit card bill show up. And the bill collectors knock at the door. And the repo man shows up to get your car. And then the fights begin. The worst part of that kind of attitude, though, is that when something comes up that you really do want to invest in, you can't. You can't because you're strapped 
So your heart's right. God has changed your heart, but you almost feel like it's too late. I really want to do this, but you don't understand, Pastor. I can't. First of all, I do understand. I know what that's like. I've been there. And there are two types of roads we can take in a message like this. We can, first of all, focus on all the things you've done wrong in the past. But I just don't think that's helpful because we've all done that. We're all culpable. We know that our issue has never been a lack of money. It's an unwillingness to change our behavior toward money. All of us have been there. Some of us are still there. And especially in the West, you have to understand how the temptation is so strong. We want all the latest gadgets. In the West, we don't distinguish between want and need. Uh, We live above our means. We spend when we should probably save. We splurge when we should probably be more conservative. It's the American way. Have everything right now. And for the most part, all of us, you, me, we, fall for the lie that our happiness is based on having whatever we want, whenever we want it. And so mom goes out and buys designer clothes for the baby. Baby doesn't even know what designer clothes are. But she wants to put it on Facebook so everybody see her baby's important. And then dad goes out and buys cars that he really can't afford. Why? To prove to the world that he matters and he's made it and he's a step above everybody else. You know, there's a real freedom in not having that kind of attitude. Because my cars are all paid for. My little Jetta, that thing's paid for, been paid for. I get to drive that, I call it the poor man's BMW. I love that little Jetta. I don't care what people think about me. I love that little car. And so we do things that make no sense. And then as parents, we want our kids to have the best so that when they go to school, no one looks down on them. So that we are up there with the elite. And the real problem is a spiritual problem. It's not a financial one. Because you have not yet learned, we have not learned, that our upward mobility is based on God, not on man. And man is fickle anyway. They're not worried about what you're wearing. They're too concerned about what they're wearing and what they're driving. So here we are, many of us in the room, we've sacrificed our future for the pleasure of the present. And we find ourselves in this situation. We could dwell the whole time on how we got here, but I think it's much more productive to ask the separate question. Now that we're here, where do we go now? And how does this solve the tension, financial tension, in our marriage? Now, according to statistics, about two-thirds of you are in this tension. Two-thirds. Now, even if you're single, you you can be in financial tension. You don't have to be married to be in financial tension. You can be in the same thing, same place. So how do, what do we do? So here's the first thing I want to do. I want to give you three things you have to do to get on the right path. Here's the first, all in Scripture. First, you've got to make a decision today to begin living a Christ-like life in relation to your finances. I can't determine what you've done in the past, but I can tell you this. You've got to walk out here this weekend. If you want this pressure and ball and chain to go away, you've got to decide you're going to relate to God in a way that's appropriate concerning your finances. So where your money and wealth is concerned, you either go at it with God or you go at it alone. It's your choice. But know this, and this is important, God is not an enabler. He does not reward bad behavior. That's not his style. So you can't say, Lord, bless my marriage while I'm having an affair. You with me? You can't say, Lord, bless my finances while I practice stealing, while I live above my means, while I have poor investment practices, while I live as though my entire life is all about me. God, let me do this, and I expect you to bless me. God's not an enabler, and we're going to see that just in a moment. So first, you've got to make a decision that today... You're going to begin living a Christ-like life in relation to your finances. You say, okay, Pastor Jeff, I'm ready. What do I do? Do you know out of all the questions you ask a pastor, this is the easiest one? Do you know why? Because Jesus talked more about it than any other topic. And basically, Jesus goes on to say that this is kind of a litmus test of where your heart really is, how you relate to your wealth. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's not a difficult passage to exegete. Jesus basically says, you're going to invest in the areas that you care most about, bottom line. And I've used the example in the past when I was in New Zealand, I had no trouble, and I came to this realization, no trouble buying the best golf equipment, playing the best golf clubs, and paying whatever I had to do to participate in the thing that I love. But when the offering plate comes around, suddenly, I got to have to take a crowbar to my wallet. 
what's the problem? This is my love. This is the thing I tolerate. And it was a real life-changing, transformational kind of thing for me to realize who I was on the inside. So the issue from the get-go is what do you care most about? Because whatever you care most about, that's a good test because that's where your resources are going to go. Not all of them, not all of them, but this is where your heart is. Therefore, your budget sheet will reveal it. Now, when the Bible talks about this, it says that when your heart has been transformed by the gospel, there are three attitudes that every believer has. One is this. You come to the conclusion that you are a steward, not an owner, that you own nothing, that everything you have is owned by God and has been given to you by God. Psalm 24 in the Old Testament says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So the Christ follower knows that what we have, we have been given to care for, for God's glory alone. Bill Peel says, although God gives us all things richly to enjoy, nothing is ours. Nothing really belongs to us. God owns everything. We're responsible for how we treat it and what we do with it. While we complain about our rights here on earth, the Bible constantly asks, what about your responsibilities? Owners have rights. Stewards have responsibilities. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity said, every faculty you have, your power of thinking, or of moving your limbs from moment to moment is given to you by God. If you devoted every moment of your whole life exclusively to His service, you could not give Him anything that was not in His sense, or in a sense, His already. So the reason it's so easy to answer the question is because parable after parable that Jesus tells reminds you, tries to pull you back into this one concept. You're not not the owner. You're the renter. You're the tenant. Everything you have is a gift from God, and it ultimately belongs to Him. And one day we will stand before God, and we will give back to Him what is rightfully His. And the one question that will emerge is this. What kind of steward were you with God's stuff? How did you use it? And then Jesus says the answer to that will reveal the difference between who you really are, authentic believers whose hearts have been transformed by the overwhelming generosity and sacrifice of Jesus for you, over and against those whose hearts are remaining hard. Therefore, you can summarize it by saying, if I'm still living like an owner, the gospel has not truly penetrated my heart. Because the one word that sums up Jesus' idea of your stuff is the word stewardship. Stewardship. And he tells so many parables that we could, you know, we could do a a series on these parables. Let's just mention one because I think most of us are familiar with it. It's where Jesus says, do you want to know what the kingdom of God is really like? Do you want to know what the kingdom of heaven is really like? It's like a master who turns over to his servants, his wealth, and goes away on a journey. He gives five talents, and talents are always refer to money, folks. It's at least money. It could be more than that, but it's at least at its core money. Five talents and another two and another one. The guy who was given five doubled it. The guy who was given two doubled it. The guy who was given one hit it in the ground. And Jesus is quite harsh. I mean, he's probably more harsh here than any other text that I'm aware of because he talks about the one that hid it and did nothing with it for the sake of the kingdom of God. And in verse 30, he says, Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he says, this guy's worthless. He doesn't get it. He thinks he's an owner. Throw him outside. That's pretty harsh. And whatever the secondary meanings are, The primary meaning is undeniable, and it's this. What you do with your wealth matters in eternity. What you do with what God gives you now does matter. And it also reveals your true heart. As it turns out, Jesus would say that the way you relate to your wealth is a wordless expression of your true commitment. So first, for a believer who wants to relate to God and get God involved in this area of the marriage or this area of life, Number one, you realize you're a steward, not an owner. And two, you start to understand that you cannot worship God, truly worship God without sacrifice. In Malachi 3, God is complaining to a group of people who claim they love him. And God says, you you call me me father, but where's the respect? You give me no respect. You give me no honor, and yet you say I'm the Lord and I'm the father of your life. And they say, well, how how have we violated that? And then he says, by saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? 
When you sacrifice lame and diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now, what is God saying here? Well, my friend Ravi Zacharias talks about a time when he was growing up in New Delhi, India. And he wasn't a Christ follower at this point. He was young. And the local priest of the Catholic Church in New Delhi asked him if he would play Joseph in the upcoming Christmas play. He had no interest in still, until he saw Mary. And he realized he would have no speaking parts. All he would have to do is walk Mary from the back of the church onto the stage. Instant interest, he said. So he was told what time to arrive for play rehearsal. He got there about 15 minutes early. And he noticed at the back of the church was this tray with lots of bread in it. It was the communion tray, communion bread, and some juice. So he decided to help himself. He was quite hungry, so he took all the bread he could and stuffed it in his pocket and took the rest and just started gobbling it down. He didn't know any better. Suddenly, the priest from the behind saw everything, started rushing out toward him. Ravi thought he was just coming out to greet him. And Ravi said, he gave me a verbal bashing whose only redeeming factor was I did not understand a word he said. And he kept using this word that I was not familiar with. It was the word sacrilege. Now, he said, I had to laugh years later after I had become a Christ follower, and I was reading a book by G. Campbell Morgan, who was defining sacrilege and explaining that sacrilege is taking something that belongs to God and using it profanely, kind of like Belshazzar did when we participated in our study of the book of Daniel. So he takes the holy vessels out of the tabernacle, and he brings them into a, a sensuous party where they're drinking wine out of something that is sacred. But he says, G. Campbell Morgan gave me another definition of sacrilege that I have kept hidden my heart for a very long time. He says, sacrilege is to take something, give it to God when it means very little or nothing to you. So that's God's complaint. You are giving me something that you don't want anyway or that doesn't have great value. As if you can discard it, as if I don't matter. And true worshipers begin to understand that part of your life Not only your money, but everything about you is sacrificial. You offer your life as a sacrifice out of gratitude, not out of merit to earn salvation, but out of gratitude for the sacrifice and generosity God has given you. When your heart's been changed, what God has done to make you his treasure, you will make him yours. So if you want to relate to God appropriately concerning your finances, first you realize You're a steward, not the owner. God owns everything. Two, you realize you can't truly give God a life of worship without sacrifice. And three, this is the important one. Well, they're all important, but they build on each other. Worship, sacrifice, and stewardship are demonstrated in the covenant renewal ceremony of the tithe and the first fruits principle. In Proverbs 3, we're told, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, from the get go in the Old Testament, remember what I said last week? I said, People ask me, show me in the Bible, Pastor Jeff, where it says that I can't have sex with someone before marriage. And I said, okay, here's my text, Genesis 1 through Revelation 21. You understand the covenant relationship. Now, here's the good thing about talking about this topic on this weekend. This is not a weekend. We're trying to raise money. So you have to decide, is Pastor Jeff trying to manipulate me, or does he really care about my marriage? See, there's no fundraiser at the end of this message. So why would Pastor Jeff be talking about this? Could it be that Pastor Jeff really does care about me and wants to get me out of this horrible situation I find myself in? See, if you don't believe that, then you're going to listen with different ears. So I'm just trying to tell you, this is not a fundraiser weekend. This is simply trying to show you the way out of the bondage that many of Americans have fallen into based on the Word of God. So that's why I want you to take your phone out, really, and go to the notes page. And I'm going to give you eight steps here. And I seldom do this. And they'll appear on the board and we'll leave it long enough for you to write them down. Because somewhere, either with a piece of paper and pencil or with your notes, I want you to write these down. Never forget them. They are eternal and unchanging. And so you can always go back to this and remind yourself. And I want you to remember. Because the Bible says for the Christ follower who truly understands what it is to relate to God on the basis of grace, sacrifice, generosity, the first thing that person is going to do is they're going to give the first fruits of God. First fruits of God. Remember, they belong to Him. They're going to give the first fruits. What God has entrusted to them, they're going to give back to God. It's called tithing. 
And the first thing you need to know about tithing is tithing is a universal principle. It is not something that stopped with the Old Testament. Neither did it start with the Mosaic Code. Any Bible scholar knows that it didn't originate from the law, and it doesn't stop with the law. It is established before the law and extends far beyond the Mosaic Code. Abraham, hundreds of years before Moses was even born, brought tithes to Melchizedek, and we go right back to the original creation story in Genesis 4. Do you remember what happened? Let me read it. The Bible says that Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. What's the problem? It's very simple. Even in the days of creation, Abel brought the best of the best of who he was and what he had. Cain brought what was left over. And this doesn't please God. And not only does it not please God, it causes an internal tension in you because you know you're not doing the right thing. And so the Bible tells us that Cain's countenance fell, that he was depressed. And then he becomes angry, and then he kills his brother. So first, then we go to second. Tithing is a thermometer of spiritual vitality. So since we see it all through the Bible, Jesus comes along in the New Testament and says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So your money goes toward that which you value the most. Again, not rocket science. If you value the kingdom of God and Jesus' work in the world, your budget sheet is going to reveal that. That's why Jesus says it's a thermometer of spiritual vitality. It reveals your heart. Three, tithing is a thermometer. Sorry, tithing is the starting place for New Testament giving. Okay. In both the Old and New Testaments, we see two words describing what we give to God. It is tithes and offering. Now, why is there a distinction between the two? Well, when I was growing up, the deacons would come before the church, and before we took the offering, they would always pray a prayer that said, Lord, bless these tithes and offerings. The Bible actually makes that distinction too. All the way back in Malachi... When God is complaining about the heart of his people, he says, Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. Now, there's a rumor going around that Pastor Jeff said that when it comes to giving, I give whatever I've decided in my heart. Did I say that? Yes, I did. But I'm assuming that's your offering. I think you've misunderstood. You see, the tithe is something that God has a legal claim to. The first 10% of everything you have, the first fruits, belongs to God. What you give on top of that is what you decide in your heart between you and God. That's called your offering. But there's a legal claim on the first 10% to show that you are willing to externally demonstrate what you say you believe internally, and that is that everything ultimately belongs to God anyway. That's why God uses the word rob. You can't rob somebody unless you're taking something from them that rightfully belongs to them. So God says, when you don't return the first fruits of your life to me, you're actually stealing from me. You're taking something that doesn't belong to you. So that's, that's, that's pretty aggressive. So tithing is a starting place for New Testament giving. Here's four. The tithe is one-tenth of your total income. That's what tithe means. The first fruits of your life. That's what the Old Testament means by tithe. The first ten. Which means five that you're offering then is this. The offering is what you give above and beyond what is required. So the tithe is what you rightfully give back to God. He's the owner of all things. Then the offering is what you give to God in appreciation, and as a way of investing in something that you say matters to you. You say, some people would say, why on earth would I do that? Here's why. You're going back to the covenant of baptism. When you were baptized, you say, God, my goals are your, your goals are my goals. Your objectives are my objectives. Your passion is my passion. So knowing now that God's primary passion is to bring the kingdom of God into reality in this world, that people far from God would move near to God. That means you have new passions and you have new objectives. You still live your life, but now you've got a different goal. You're living for a kingdom beyond yourself. Therefore, you try to position yourself when your heart has been transformed in such a way to invest in the things that you know really matter. 
That's why the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now, in that verse, the Apostle Paul is assuming that the passion of your life is to reap a great harvest. And because that is the passion of your life, you're going to position yourself where you can sow generously. Now, this might be hard for some of you to take, but here's the reality. Some of you have never given God an offering in your entire life because you've never given Him a tithe. And you can't give an offering until you've given a tithe. Now, once again, I know that was a bit, well, it was clear. Look, you know, in the past I used to apologize for these sermons. I, I, I can't do that anymore. You've you got to get to a point where you, okay, why is pastor doing this? You, you have to get to that point where sooner or later we become a family where we trust each other and we're assuming we're trying to help each other. I can't do anything about that. And I said years ago that it's impossible to manipulate and coerce people in giving their money because they're never going to do it no matter what you say until the heart's transformed. So my job is to teach you what Jesus says about this. And when your heart's transformed, it'll be a natural byproduct, which is why I feel no pressure. It's not my job. My job is simply to give you the gospel. But here's what I'm assuming. I think over the years I've learned that most of you in this room do really want to live a life that models your belief that everything belongs to God. I think you really do want to invest in the kingdom and eternity. I really think most of you want to sow great seeds and reap a great harvest. I do believe that. I also believe that you do want to worship God with sacrifice. That's your heart. That you want to give up things you love for something you love more. That you want His purposes to come to fruition in your life. I think most of you are exactly like that. I also think that you want your worship and your sacrifice and your stewardship to be demonstrated in the tithe and the first fruits principle. I think that many of you would agree, you know, I do need to give, I give God nothing. I give God leftovers. I mean, I just give him what I think I don't need or want. I do really want to be the kind of person that brings the very best, the first fruits. I mean, it's all the way back in Genesis and it's all the way through Revelation. That's who I want to be. The problem is your heart's right, but you learned this too late in life in your mind and now you're saying, Jeff, I would love to, but you don't know. You don't understand. I got so much debt, I can barely breathe. I can't do this. I want to do it, but I can't. Okay. Here's what you need to do. Here's where you go from here according to the scripture. And here's how it solves the tension in marriage. First, you make a decision today to begin living a Christ-like life in relation to our finances. So start today. Forget about the past. Don't beat yourself up. It is what it is. We've all been there. We've all done that. Start today. Now, here's the second thing you're going to have to do. You've got to make a decision today to get out of debt. Don't you wish you could go to sleep and you wake up tomorrow and all the debt is gone? Don't you wish Jesus would do a supernatural work and suddenly all your debt disappears? Wouldn't that be, that would be the greatest miracle of all to most of you. The reality though is God doesn't work that way because he wants you to go on this faith journey with him. The best thing you can do today is walk out of here after this service on all campuses and go to the info table. And we have people whose gift God has given them the ability to show you how to manage your finances to get out of debt because it is very possible. And so they tithe their gift, not only their money, they tithe their gift to do it free for people who want to get out of debt. So we've got tens and tens of coaches who are more than willing to sit down with you and show you how this can become a reality. The debt will not disappear, and quite frankly, if it doesn't disappear, you'll never be able to be a good steward with what God has given you, and you will not be able to stand before Jesus and hear the words, hey, in this area, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. If you want to get right in this area and please him in this area, it starts by you making an intentional decision that enough is enough, and you're going to walk out here, and we're going to help you get out of debt. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Nobody's going to show up at your house and start repoing. That's not what this is about. This is about showing you how this can become a reality. We have numerous advisors who steward the gift God has given them. Now, I want to tell you something about the marriage. If you're experiencing this in marriage or even as a single person, do you know almost immediately after you sign up, some of the tension is going to leave? It's the, it's the way of human nature. When I was going through my anxiety disorder, you say, oh boy, man, it was a whole year. He hadn't mentioned it. Here we go again. <laughs> I was in such disarray, and I was panicking literally about panicking. That's pretty bad, isn't it? You're panicking about panicking. 
you're afraid that you might be fearful. And when I went to the, the Dr. Lindenheimer that I've talked about so often, and I still go to visit about every four months, and I'm sitting there in the chair and I'm saying, Dr. Lindenheimer, I don't know what's going on. I'm losing my mind. I can't get up in the morning. I, I, I'm anxious every time I hear an ambulance. I think I'm dying. My, I'm all messed up. you got to help me. And finally, after I'd just been, you know, kind of vomiting on him all these issues that I had, he puts his hand on my shoulder and he says, Jeff, you're going to get better. And as soon as he said that, it was like, wow, there's light at the end of this tunnel. I'm going to get, there's hope. As soon as you make the right decision in this area, what happens is you sense the fact that, wow, there is hope. I'm going to do what is necessary and I'm going to get out of this and position myself where I can be faithful to God. And you know what happens in your marriage? I've seen this. The two of you now will come together and there will be a peace because you know you're doing the right thing. There's a real joy and satisfaction that comes from knowing together you're going to tackle this thing. And the truth will set you free. Do you remember what happened in Genesis 4, 6? The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? He's basically saying, Cain, do you want to feel better? Do the right thing. Do the right thing. There's a sense of accomplishment between husband and wife when you come together and claim small victories in this area. You start to sacrifice for a common goal. You begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel and hope. Everything begins to shift and change. It's almost like for the joy set before you, you now endure the cross. And it will be a cross. You didn't get into this situation overnight. You're not going to get out of it overnight. But the journey is fulfilling. Because every step of the way, God will show you how he will be faithful as you move in and begin to do the right thing. And soon you will be freed up to live and invest in kingdom realities. And anybody who uses their resources in this manner knows that it's so fulfilling, guys. Nothing better. When we lived in Cincinnati and I was in seminary, I remember coming home uh, one day after school. And I was on 75 and I had to turn off to go to the apartments Robin and I lived in. We had Delaney at that point. And as I'm coming to the intersection, I look down, look left, and there's a... There's somebody under the bridge in, in somewhat raggedy clothes, but not too raggedy, with a sign, and I couldn't read the sign, but I had the sense that God wanted me to go there. Now, I know that so many of these things are rackets. I got that. I understand that completely, and I don't want to become an enabler, but in this particular case, I could hear the voice of God, not audibly, but I knew God wanted me to go there, so I drove my car, parked under the bridge, and he had a unique sign. And the sign said, I don't want money, I just need food for my kids. And he kind of looked like a father. You know, he kind of looked that part. So I took him to Kroger, which is a popular supermarket on the East Coast, and I, I said, look, just get whatever you need, and I'll be waiting on you right here. So he went through, filled up the buggy, I think it was about $250, which Robin and I did not have at that point. But at least we had a roof over our heads and food to eat. And I noticed when I looked in his cart, it was things you would buy for little kids. Things that would last, imperishables. I say, this guy's on the, he's on the level. No beer, you know, no whiskey, no Jack Daniels. All things that he would need, you would need, staples. And I took him out uh, back. He said, just drop me at the bridge and I'll, I'll have my wife come and get me. I'll tell her we have food. I said, let me take you home. He said, no, it's, it's all right. We're fine. I want to thank you. I got in my car and I started driving back home. I started weeping. I'm not sure why. I wasn't sure why at the, point, at the time, but it dawned on me later there is an incredible deep joy and sense of satisfaction when we're able to help someone who's in genuine need. And I think most of your hearts are like that. You find yourself in a position where you don't know how to get out of it. It breaks your heart. That's why. First, you've got to make a decision. You have to make a decision to begin living a Christ-like life in relation to your finances. Second, you've got to do what's necessary to get out of debt. By the way, let me say again, I've been here. I was here in this particular predicament when we lived in New Zealand. I was not good in this area. I'm a sanguine personality. I love the game of golf. And if I saw it and wanted it, I bought it. And I was hugely responsible for the financial situation Robin and I found ourselves in. And we had a, a financial counselor come over and speak with us. And we did that because I, I, I'd never seen my wife cry before. And we were going over the budget and the sheets. We had two kids, and I saw her cry. 
First time and only time I've ever seen her cry. And I realized I had not been a good husband in this area. She was under enormous pressure. And so we got a, a financer to come over and to deal with us. Unfortunately, it was the wrong person to invite over. It was actually my brother-in-law who was an accountant. And his comment to us was, well, you knew you were going to be poor when you decided to go into ministry. That was his advice to us. And I thought, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible teaches me at all. I realized that the major issue was not a lack of money. It was a behavioral problem. And Robin and I began at that moment, we developed the envelope system at the advice of someone else where we put the cash that we got in envelopes, and when it's gone at the end of the month, it's gone. So you live within your means. That was difficult for me, man, because that golf envelope did not have as much money as I wanted it to have. <laughs> so, you know, it was difficult parking my car and sneaking on golf courses without paying. That was very difficult. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. But I noticed as soon as my wife and I started honoring God, not only in our tithe, but also in the way we used our money, there was an instant change. Her respect for me, the peace in the home, and the trust that because we're doing the right thing, God's going to move here. And the third thing, if you want God involved in this, you've got to make a decision to honor God by tithing. Now, here's the deal. Some of you are going to say, you know, Pastor Jeff, this seems counterproductive to me. What you're telling me is I'm in debt and I don't have a lot of money, and to solve that, give 10% of everything I have away. Well, hold on a second. Do you want to understand how the gospel is the great inversion? To gain my life, I must lose it. If I want to live, I must first die. To go up, I must first go down. And our ultimate example is Jesus. To win the ultimate victory, he must suffer the ultimate defeat. And I'm telling you that when it comes to your finances, the great inversion is in play. So much so that the sixth principle tells us that the tithe is the only area in life where God says, try me. God looks at you and he says, test me in this. I can't be an enabler. I can't reward you for bad behavior, but if you'll test me in this, man, I'm going to open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings on you, but you've got to make the first move. And the phrase in the Bible is without parallel. It's in reference to an armored glove called the gauntlet. And so when someone felt like they had been insulted, and they, if they looked at a person and said, you know, I know what you said and I know what you meant. I know what you're implying, and I recognize your insult. So that's it. And you would take off the gauntlet, and you would throw down the gauntlet and say, that's it, you and me, one-on-one, -on -one, pal. Mono, mono, you and me, we're going to solve this. So God takes that same principle in Malachi, and he throws down the gauntlet to his people, and he says, you don't think you can trust me? You don't think I know what you make? You don't think I know what my part is? You don't think I know what you're giving or holding or withholding? Try me. Test me in this. Right now, right here, you and me one-on-one. -on -one. It's going to take some faith, but you will not lose in this. I don't know any other place in the Bible where Jesus says, test me, try me. God says, test me, try me in this. You will not lose, but you've got to take a step of faith. Rick Olympius who does our baptisms uh, on our Easter weekends, and he, was, uh, he's usually on, he usually attends the Saturday night service. I had heard his story before, but uh, I wanted to know greater detail. So on Friday morning, I invited him for a coffee at Coffee Clatch, and he shows up, and I said, look, I've heard your story. Can you, can you let me know details? I want to get my facts right. And he said, Jeff, for the most part of our lives, listen, for the most part of our lives, my wife and I were about status-seeking we thought we had to have everything to show everybody that we were important, and by doing that, we'd get even more. And we were credit happy, man. Anything we wanted to give the idea or the picture that we had people of prestige, or we were people of prestige, we bought it. And then one day, even though we were both working, it wasn't an absence of money. It was just the way we were related to it. One day, we looked at the budget sheet, we looked at where we were, and we realized we're in trouble. There's no way to recover from this. We were in so deep that we needed a miracle. And what I really liked about Rick is Rick said, look, I'm not saying God works with everybody this way. I'm just telling you the story of how God worked with me. And God started saying this to me. You're a Christian in name only because you've never put God on the front burner of your life, Rick. 
And now you're in so deep and you're in so deep, and now you want me to rescue you. Rick said he could hear God saying, why have you robbed me of all the grace and love I've given you? I've invested in you with enormous grace, mercy, and love, and I've got nothing in my return. Rick said, I could hear the Spirit of God saying to me that I have given you everything, you've given me nothing. The kingdom of God is not important to you. And Rick said he and his lovely wife got together and they looked at all they had and suddenly they felt ashamed because they realized two-thirds of the stuff they didn't even need. It was all for look. He said, I was selfish, we were selfish, and we realized in that one moment we had disrespected God that we needed a behavioral change. And I liked the fact that Rick was so honest because he said, it wasn't easy, Jeff, it was hard. Because basically God said this to me, I am the only one, Rick, that can help you out of this situation. Test me in this. But Rick, if you don't test me in this, I'm going to test you and I'm going to take everything you have away from you. So it's your call. You test me or I'm going to test you. And Rick said in that moment, they decided as a couple to look at what they didn't need. They started tithing and they believed that God was saying, give me the first fruits of your life and watch what I can do. Rick said, we turned everything over to him. We got rid of things we didn't need. We stopped robbing God. We gave him the first fruits of our life. Again, he said, it wasn't easy. And Jeff, he said, I can tell you that in those first few years, I really can't explain how we made it. The only explanation I have is supernatural algebra. He said, I I don't know how we managed to do it, but we realized as long as we were faithful to God, we always seemed to have enough. So we decided to continue that practice. And we got to the point where we were actually fearful not to keep doing it. That would be a slap in the face of God. He had proven himself. Why would we not continue? And Rick said, the goal of my life at this point now is to stand before God in this area and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, Rick was able to retire at 55. (laughs) He had been so... Faithful that God blessed him so much, no need for him to work now. So he volunteers all of his time in ministry. And on Monday night prayer meeting, next week, we're going to ordain him into ministry because he wants to serve full-time in hospice and in chaplaincy. And he got there because at one point in his life, he said, no, let's test God in this and see what he will do. That's why seven... Tithing positions me to receive blessings from God. That is the clear teaching of Scripture where the Bible says, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. So that the message of Scripture is no tithe, no returning. If you don't give God the first fruits, he's not an enabler and the windows of heaven are shut. It is a poetic license illustrating a barrier between you and God. It doesn't mean you're not saved. Do not put words in my mouth. You're saved by grace through faith. That is not what this sermon's about. This sermon is about do you want God involved in this area of your life or not? You're either going to go at it alone or go at it with God. But there is a natural byproduct in your heart of someone whose heart has been transformed that you really do want to position yourself where you can sow generously that you might reap a great harvest. That's heart revealing. Has the gospel truly penetrated your heart? So eight, disobedience then in tithes and offerings equals stealing from God. Now, don't shoot the messenger. God said to his people, why will you rob me? You can't rob somebody Folks, the Bible teaches you that everything you have is from God. And if you take that 100% that you have, 10% of it is not yours. The only thing that is yours is the 90. That's a pretty good deal by God, isn't it? Sweet deal. Everything's from me. 90's you get to use. 10 goes back to the purposes that I have in this world. Now, how does this Relieve some of the tension. Let me tell you what's happened in my own life. When I'm tithing, this is important. When I am tithing, there is a peace that comes in knowing that when hard times come, I am not reaping the whirlwind of my own disobedience to God. There's a peace that knows if hard times do come, 
God is doing something in my life because it's not here because I've disobeyed him. I have been obedient in this aspect of my life, which is why God says, test me and I will open the windows of heaven. You've got to have a paradigm shift in your life because most of us think by withholding, you are protecting your money, but in reality, you are destroying the potential of God's blessings to permeate your life. So here's what you do. Here's your action point. First, make a decision today to begin living a Christ-like life in relation to our finances. You can make the decision today. And if you're serious about it, number two, do everything you can. Do what is necessary to get out of debt. You don't know what to do? Walk out there, sign up at the table. We will coach you through it, and you can position yourself where you will be in a place to do what your heart really wants to do. Three, make a decision to honor God by tithing. It's the great inversion. Everybody can do this part. You decide today, I don't want to go at my finances alone, so today I'm going to go to the app. You can do this. I'm going to go to the app, on Valley app, and I'm going to right now set aside the first fruits that belongs to God anyway, and I'm going to start doing it right now. I'm going to test them and see what God will do. Why would God say, test me and then fail you? It's really a matter of your faith and trust, not his ability or faithfulness. So, one, Here's the advantage. Your countenance is lifted when you are doing what's right. I'm telling you, your wife, your husband, you will come together and you will begin to be for each other, not against each other, and you will know you're on the right path to freedom. Two, your faith and trust in God are unifying. This will unify you toward a common goal and you will have patience with each other and peace with each other and it will galvanize the marriage because you're marching toward the same goal. Three, Living for a purpose greater than yourself galvanizes a marriage, especially where women are related, where women in, sorry, in, in uh, response or in the area of a woman's love for her husband, when she sees her husband start living his life for more than just stuff, it is, she is drawn to him. And that's why I always tell men, you may not understand this, but if you want a regular covenant renewal ceremony, Let your wife see that you live for a purpose greater than your own selfish, narcissistic desires. We know that. We proved that last week in our sex survey that was written and published. We know it. Fourth, God's way of dealing with your money frees you up to invest in things that matter. That's what you're really after. I truly believe that, that your heart is right. So you have one of three things to do. One, walk out. Go to the table. Get out of debt. Two, Some of you aren't in debt, but you're just not being faithful with your first fruits. You go to the app and decide today, I'm giving to God what is rightfully his. Don't wait every week to decide. Decide once and for all. Let it come out automatically, the first fruits off the top to God and his work in the world. And three, some of you need this. See, the reason your heart's not moved in this message, because you've never made this covenant. Ah, now the cat is out of the back. See, you've never died to your old way and said, my passions are God's passions, God's objectives are my objectives, God's goal. That's my, because you've never had this covenant experience. And that's why you wonder why you're angry and frustrated and why you don't trust a pastor when he preaches on this because your heart's not been changed yet. If your heart has been changed, here's what you're thinking right now. Pastor, you're right, pray for me. That's what you're thinking. I need to, I need to get this right in my life. So if you're in the room and you've never done that, this is the weekend where you enter the covenant and then the power of God will not only change what you do, he will change what you want to do. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for your love For us, thank you for your guidance in our lives, and I would pray in Christ's name right now that if there's any person on any campus that has not yet entered into a covenant with you in baptism, that this would be the weekend that they do it, and then the Spirit of God would begin to transform them. I pray for us, those of us who have already been in that covenant and have been in a while, that our eyes would be open, that you are the owner, we are the tenant. And one day we will stand before you and we will answer the question, how did we steward the resources God gave to us? May we have done so in such a way that you would look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. In Christ's name I pray. Congratulations on finishing another video here at the One and All YouTube channel. I'm so glad we got to experience that together and I'd love to experience another video with you. So why don't you pick this one right here, this video, or you can subscribe right here. And I'd love it if you were inspired by this video in any way, if you would take the time to hit the like button, comment, 
and even consider sharing this content with a friend because chances are if it inspired you, it's gonna inspire somebody you know. Let's continue on this journey together and watch another video.